Texas Instrument Home Computer from the early 1980s. Now, if you really want to program, you want to have a, you need the, all the memory you can get, and you want access to sprites, you got to have Extended Basic. That's where it's at. Now, the way you get to your old programs, this is actually not how I did it back in the day. This is actually a lot easier reading it like from a from a disc. I actually had to pull these in from old cassette tapes, and you'd actually hear the program being read through. And, uh, and some, uh, you know, horrible kind of musical noise. And it would take forever to save. It often save with errors. You'd have to resave it again, then check it, and play it back. It could take hours to save. Or even uh, just reading a good copy could take uh, several attempts. I remember a few times I'd write programs, I couldn't save them. And I'd, like, panic. I'd leave the computer on overnight. I'd go to school. I'd come back home. I would, uh, you know, try to save it again. Keep trying and trying. Different tapes, unplug, replug stuff. You know, I had so many things you could try, and usually, eventually, I'd get it. But it was such, such a, a stressful uh, waste of time and energy. And I remember even the first time on the first like IBM computer I got, it was um, with the the floppy disk, the five and a quarter floppy disk. And the first time I saved to that. It was so quick, I was almost, I was just stunned. I was literally speechless just sitting there, seeing how quick and easy it could save a program. Uh, maybe let's speed this up a little bit and get some of the, the music to go with it. Science fair. Here, you're in the science fair. Here's a volcano. Good volcano, kind of typical. You have the volcanoes, you had dinosaurs, you know, you had the solar system, you had different things. And I was like, computers, back in 1989, small town, Illinois, this was something different. Yeah. The audio is pretty bad here. It was, I had more, uh, more audio and it sounded a little better on the Reginald TI, but uh, it sucked up memory. I had to take it out. And, um,. These are some harsh sprites here. Well, that scientist just jumped a bit there. Doing sprites was a lot of fun. Everything was uh, it's a good sound. A lot of um, everything was defined on a grid and then converted over to like a hex system, and then uh, that was converted over to to like just a long string of hex numbers and letters. And it was a good bit of work, but I really enjoyed it for some reason. Actually, one of the few things I actually got good at is doing converting binary and hex. Look at that guy, how happy. He went from paper shuffling to typing on a computer. Quite the challenge for the computer back in the day. And um, it was funny, the, the kid who came in first, I came in second in the science fair with this, is he actually complained. He thought it was so impressive for the time that he complained to the teacher that I should have came in first, which is quite the compliment. It was funny, my uh, my kids were watching this, even though this was 25 years ago, and they're watching the weather. Computers can predict the weather. Like, computers don't do a good job now predicting the weather. I'm like, you're kind of right. They don't, but eh, there's still a lot of potential there. Galactic Horse Racing. I used to spend a lot of time and energy and memory on uh, trying to make fancy title screens. Uh, I remember that. Uh, some games, uh, the title screen it would, would look great, and then uh, by the time I got to the actual game, I was kind of uh, out of motivation. But this one got was finished. It was a rare completion. Cycle through all the colors, all the tones. Here comes the comet, the sprite shooting across the screen. Kind of a pain if you were anxious to play the game. And here we are. All right, enter first player. Enter first player. I first made this. I had it where you could pick how many players play the game, like two to six or something, but and it was always just the, the four of us. 
and it was just easier to take space. Let's take that out and save, uh, save memory. Pick a horse to win. So, right. How much? I used to have it where you could also you could pick win, place, or show, and that actually made it a lot more interesting. But I had a lot of problems with that. Just the, the memory always crashing. There might, there might have been a more clever way to write it, or if I had more memory, it would work great. But it would actually blow up in the middle of the program. So as a shortcut, I just I took out place and show, and it was just going for the win. Setting up the track and got the horses lined up, and they're off. You got your audience in front. Well, number four is flying out of here. Every horse had a little uh, positive uh, kind of quirk and a negative quirk that made the race a little more interesting. So you got the audience. You got people, robots, and aliens. They change all three screens. And you hear the race. The horses start jockeying for position. Slow it down. Speed it up. Maybe backwards. And uh, I was really trying to push the limits of what the TI could do in terms of sprite graphics for the audience in the background and the racetrack itself. And having like the little sign in the background change and the starting and finish lines being in different positions. And uh, one of the reasons this is galactic horse racing is because animating horse legs running would have been a lot, of, a lot of work and memory. So it was just easier to have the horses hover. Problem solved. Black horse racing. That's yeah, more interesting than anyway. Oh, here comes number four. And he, what a, what a finish. And uh, it shows the winning, how much you've won, how much you've lost. You get the stats in here, and after a while, these stats actually kind of became meaningful. Be, however, the, the TI randomized, you could start to see patterns. It even worked better when there was win, place, and show, but even if win, there was um, some value to that. The quest for the Rublin. Another fancy title screen. I even, uh, this is one of the few times they even try to make really trying to make the letters look less blocky by putting angles on, uh, on a lot of the characters I use for the title letters. That white line going across the sword is supposed to be like the shine of the sword. There was a reason why I didn't have an inner key for the screen. I don't remember what it was. It's a memory problem? A space problem? I think it, so it's on a timer. So, uh, goblins, demons... Dragons will the earth. Sacred stone called the Rubma. Oh, this was a this is a riveting story here. Finally. Oh, another page. In order to play this game, you must type in commands, usually two words. Examples are get table. Yes, that's what I want. It's to get a table, eat food. To move. You can do D for down, S for south. You got gold, weapons. seems clear enough we got the rules ah now this is a good looking text adventure game I remember I was very frustrated as a kid playing uh, all the text based adventure games you always want to see some kind of picture and then uh, it always I draw maps and that was kind of part of the fun but the maps would always end up not matching up once they got complicated so I liked having a, a map on the screen you got a little red dot to see where you are you got a compass you got all your stats right there your weapon armor your life, your gold, where the exits are. Now, in this first part of the level, I use so much memory, I think, of the title screen and going through the instructions and showing the first part of the dungeon here. Because I don't think there's a whole lot to do to get in here. I haven't played this in years, but let's see if I remember. Open the door, get a little sound effect, doors open. Let's go north. You've made it to the inside of the dungeon. You will continue your quest by running the next program on this tape. The code word is rubber duck. That was a way I got around memory limitations. Each dungeon level would have a different code word. So you could go to the next next uh, dungeon by going to the next program on the tape and entering the code word. Load up the next program on the disc. Or cassette back in the day. But this is so 
much nicer. I'll never forget that. Going from cassettes to disc. All right. Rubber duck. Now, what if we try something else? Just quits. Doesn't even tell you what your mistake was. Get it right this time. Ah, and we are inside the dungeon. There's a door to the north, a hole in the wall to the east, and a door out to the south. There's something on the ground. So what happens if we just leave? Do we have to if we go south out of the dungeon? We have to reload the the previous game. That's going to be kind of annoying. You do not want to leave already. You have just begun. That's a good way to solve that problem. So... I don't remember all the commands. Uh, so it just repeats the last one. Uh, I can tell it's a sword. Let's just get it. Yes. And it disappears off the screen. You get a little noise. How nice. So let's try that hole in the wall. That looks like it's to the east. The end of a long hall, there is a small, slimy, ugly goblin. He appears to be guarding something, and you'd better act fast. Use sword. That is not what you want it to do. Oh, my. All right, that's annoying. Ah, beautiful. All right, let's try this again. A little wiser. It started to come back to me. All right, so we want the sword. We need some more supplies to fight that goblin. Now we're ready to go north. And here's a fountain. Making a fountainy noise. You can see the water moving, even little splashes up there. So let's try to drink some water. There, we got ten gold. We should drink some more water. I think this keeps happening. We're, getting a, we're in a lucky, uh, lucky streak there. Now, I just remember my frustration playing all those text adventure games, and I thought this would be a, you know, a big hit for something a little different, more visual. We must pay him, so we will pay him. Is you not enough gold? He doesn't tell us how much gold we need. No, I really like the way this turned out. I remember I always uh, wanted to list it in like one of those little magazines where you could buy programs, or they'd even you they didn't give you the code you could type in yourself. And that's kind of what got me started in computers. I think that my dad and I would type in games from magazines, which was very painstaking. We'd make mistakes. It would be funny to make the sprites look a little weird, and. Um, I remember like it would be variables like lives equal three. And it took me forever to realize I didn't have to put three in there. I could put like 10 or 30 and then could kind of hack the game. And that's really what got me started in coding. And um, I just remember how slow I learned stuff. Like just like call color was like a way to define different character sets with different colors. But I had no idea what the numbers represented. So I would just randomly type in, you know, start at one and keep typing in numbers until I got errors. And I would do that over and over mapping out what commands made what colors, you know, what characters, what colors. Or I remember I was, I was messing around doing like little print kind of animations. And I was doing this for like a year before I even realized there was four loops where I could uh, loop stuff instead of having to manually retype, like, you know, like some uh, fire coming out of a rocket. I would just retype the, the, the flame coming out, you know, 20, 30, 40 times instead of doing a loop. But I guess learning slow helps you... Uh, Kind of lock it in after all that misery. So we are going to the fountain. I think we're, I think we're ready to fight the goblin is, how, is what I feel. We have, we have a sword. We have a shield. I think we're ready to fight the goblin. Right, so let's go back through the hole in the wall to the east. We have both armor and a weapon. Let's use our sword on him. Yeah. 
animation, turn red, he's dying. Beautiful. So we can't do it, we can't walk now. Can't walk up there, just repeats the last command if it doesn't understand it. Open chest. Doesn't understand that either. I don't think my artificial intelligence kind of text reader was uh, was all that sophisticated. Let's just get the, the treasure, right? Beautiful. 90 gold pieces. We have 110. That's got to be enough for the invisible man. So you can. it's easy looking at the map. See, I like this map. You can see that we an exit to west. Open this door back up. Somehow it'll close behind us. Head to the north. Ah, fountain. Let's, let's risk it. Let's see what happens. Quenched your thirst. Well, that's good. Back up to the little triangle room. All these doors are closing behind us, but the shield's not there. At least I remember to to remove that. All right, now, now maybe we can pay him. Well, if I spelled it right, that would help. Pay him. Gold disappears. You assume it is safe to go down. D for down the ladder. The second level of the dungeon. Code word is cow. Well, these are good code words. So it kind of goes on from there. That was a uh, that was one of the more complete programs I created back in the day, and kind of pushing the the limits of the TI, its memory and its graphic capabilities to the limit there. But it was a, a lot of fun writing these kind of programs. A lot of fun playing them. A lot of fun sharing them.